Well, growing up in Colombia, I had access to a lot, lots of, um, lots of nature. I think that was very, very important for me as I was, uh, as I was growing up. Um, my parents are from from Cúcuta, this small town in the border of Colombia and Venezuela, and I used to spend a lot of time in farms and farms of my friends of my parents. Um, I rode horses when I was growing up, and 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 yeah, I, th I think I just had a, a, a genuine and kind of natural fascination with with animals and wildlife. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to to be when I grew up. I suppose. Um, Artist was definitely up there. I, um, I, I, that's one of the things I, I tended to, to gravitate to um, as I was growing up. Um, but, um, but I wasn't quite sure what it meant to be an artist. I, I didn't really know what, what, the, what, the, what that entailed. Um, I took a gap year between high school and college and I went to, to study art in Italy. And um, and that kind of like strangely enough shied me away away from from art um, because it was very very classical and it was like new drawing and it was pastels and it was kind of like a very antiquated um, notion of, of what it is to be an artist. So after graduating from from university for my undergrad, I worked in in New York for for seven years. I was working in in advertising. Um, and it was it was a, a great time in, in terms of, of a learning experience and what I was able to get out of of, of the work experience. But um, all throughout that time, I was working in advertising and doing photography on the side. So basically, doing like two things at once, and it was never never enough time. And I was able to when I was I, it eventually got to a point that I, I needed to to make a change. So I applied to to the Central Saint Martin's Masters in Fine Arts, um, and I got accepted. And I started that in 2012. I got interested in doing installations that had photography as well as sculpture. Um, I became really interested in the way that objects informed and transformed the photographs, and slowly. I began to understand that I didn't need the photographs altogether, that I could just work with the objects and understand how the objects could inform and transform the space. So I became very interested in, in installations and, um, and I became very interested in this concept of images that go beyond the visual plane, images that you, are, that you understand and, and, and feel beyond what you see. And, and in investigating this concept, I got interested in, in beeswax because beeswax is, is one of these substances that you not only can smell, you also, on, on sight, you can, you can understand that it's a, a, a substance that with heat, it starts to melt. Um, so you understand that it's, there's some warmth component to it. Um, so I, I, I became interested in this concept of like energy and warmth, and, and how materials have a true uh, a true importance, let's say, in, in, in the way that you perceive them. Um, so perception started to, to come into play. I also got interested in in beeswax as a substance in relation to photography because the bees go out on a two mile or two kilometer radius to pick up the pollen and their food. And from that, they craft the beeswax. So um, the beeswax becomes almost a representation, almost like a photograph or a registration of the area that's around them. So it became very interesting to me to think of like the color, the texture, the smell of the beeswax in the context of, of this like registration of the immediate land around the beehive. One of the things that, um, that we studied was, was philosophy. It, was, it had a very big philosophy background and um, for example, one of, one of the um, authors that we, we, we went into were uh, Deleuze and Guattari. And, and 
one of like the, the theories that they go into is is the rhizome, the theory of the rhizome, and and it it some of like the, the the examples that they understand to to have like rhizomatic qualities is a, is a beehive or a hive, let's say. So it immediately kind of like started to to draw connections with with my work. So I was able to understand this at a at a, yeah as a, at, a, at a deeper capacity. I started to work with a gallery called Bart Gallery, and and we had an inaugural show in Los Angeles for the gallery, and both for myself and the gallery it was the, my first solo show and the first show for for the gallery. And um, I would say like most of the work was, or like the the big part of the work was an installation of wax blocks, and I have a, a few right here. Um, so I did an installation of of these um these these wax tablets and and they basically wa worked as as almost um kind of like bricks and and they formed a membrane across the entire gallery space. So so if if you see them, they have um, a copper base in the middle that balanced the the each copper pipe. Uh, each copper piece in the center, um, so it, it almost made yeah like when you aggregated I think it was 250 or 260 different pieces. It made kind of like a membrane across the gallery space, um, and um, and yeah it was it was quite it was quite nice to work with um, that um, that amount of beeswax after. The first show that I had in Los Angeles, I looked for opportunities because I, I live in London, you see, and, and London is not a, a, a particularly friendly city for you to have lots of space. Um, so I needed to find spaces where I could have my bees, and uh, and it was quite challenging for me to, to do it in London at this stage. So I looked for residencies where I could have a studio space and have some bees. Um, so the opportunity came about to do a residency in Japan um, and in Japan I was able to find a residency with the help of the, the Colombian Embassy. So I started to, to work with, with Mr. Fujita. Mr. Fujita was, was a beekeeper that um, I was in, 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 the, in Onomichi, which is kind of like the, the Mediterranean equivalent of like uh, in Japan, let's say, and I would take a ferry to Mukoishima Island. It was like a ten-minute ferry, and Mr. Fujita was at the other side of the island, and I would cycle, take the ferry, go to his house, and then do beekeeping with Mr. Fujita. Um, there's actually a funny, a funny story about um, the first time that I went to visit him because. It was one of my, my first times that I was was, uh, was like my second day in, in in Onomichi, and I went to Mr. Fujita's house. Mr. Fujita didn't speak any English. I don't speak Japanese, or I'm trying to learn. <laughs> At the time, I didn't speak any. Um, so there was an architect that lived next door to Mr. Fujita that was able to translate a little bit about the conversation. Long story short, at the end of our encounter, Mr. Fujita asked me, oh, so you're looking for beeswax, can I give you some beeswax? And I was delighted to, to understand that, that I could get some beeswax from him. So Mr. Fujita took a, a transparent garden plastic bag and with, with a kind of machete started to cut pieces and sides of the, of the, of the frames of his beehives and started, started to put everything into this clear plastic bag <laughs> and then when it was three quarters full he just handed it to me <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't know what to do because I was on a bicycle <laughs> so <laughs> but I didn't want to refuse <laughs> the generous offering that <laughs> Mr. Fujita had given me so of course I accepted the offering <laughs> and then I had to tie the plastic bag onto my backpack 
I had a, a bicycle that was like a road bicycle, so like one of those that are like very long bicycles. So I had to ride back <laughs> 10 minutes in my bicycle with a bag of bees on my back. I could hear the buzzing of the bees. I'm sure some of them were like getting out of the bag when I go to the ferry station. The ferry operator was like, he looked at the bag and he looked at me as like, Hachi, no. Hachi, no. Hachi means bees. And obviously he saw a transparent, clear bag full of beeswax, honey, and bees. And he immediately said like, you can't go on to the ferry with a bag of bees. So I just waited and, and proceeded to wait 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes until the ferry operator understood that I didn't have any other ways of getting across. So he was like, okay, you, you can go in. You can go in. It was an outdoor, I mean, it had a, a, a outdoor, it had a, didn't have a roof, basically. <laughs> so I was able to get on the ferry and, and transport the bees safely into my studio. I quite like the idea of understanding art in the context of other other areas. Um, so I think for me, there are natural references in terms of like artists um, and and other people that work within similar type of um, I don't know, like subject matter or of materials. But um, perhaps what's most interesting for me at this stage is is understanding maybe like people from different fields and ha and what they're like talking about in relation to the, the things that I'm interested in. So more more than like references, I, I would say these are, are subjects of research. Um, one of them would be Thomas Seeley. And he's one of the, the main guys that, that discovered swarm intelligence, or like not discovered, but like really studied swarm intelligence at length. Um, he was a, a insect biologist that worked in Cornell University, and he really kind of like understood the, the 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 functions and the dynamic of the swarm. So recently, I've, I've started to work with um, a series based on on tardigrades, which are micro micro animals. They're very very small, but they're animals that have these like superhuman characteristics. They can basically die when they're dehydrated, um, spend decades in, in this, you know, like a, basically a death state, and then they come back to life when they're rehydrated. Um, they can survive in outer space, they can survive in extreme heat, they're like found in, at the foot of like active volcanoes, and basically they, 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 they are... Um, Kind of like they're, they're these very interesting animals that, that, that are quite interesting in precisely in their in their characteristics. Um, so one of one of the pieces that I've been working on, on recently is is working with kind of like these these um, shapes of of these uh, water bears or like tardigrades um, and they're anthropomorphic. I guess in, in in their shape, but yeah, I I, I I I suppose I've been very interested in 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 the characteristics of animals and 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 and, and what it means to us in terms of, of of our very delicate understanding of our environment versus this very sturdy and long-lasting um, capabilities which the which they water bears um, are able to, to cope with. Uh, right now I'm working on um, a show um, in London that's going to be in September. It's a three-person show um, and my work is going to be an installation based on, on this concept of Nendo Dango. And Nendo Dango is basically a concept that was like rediscovered by a Japanese farmer which are basically seed bombs. So they're like um, um, bombs made out of like seeds. So like in the core of the bomb, you have like seeds and you have clay and compost and soil, sometimes paper or cotton around them. And the function of the seeds are, are to 
for you to be able to like drop them in different places in different conditions and for them to sprout and, and they're, they're designed to be able to, to sprout and, and, and to germinate in a natural way um, so they've been used since ancient Egypt to after Second World War in Japan where they were trying to repopulate or re like, like um, revegetate um, some of the areas in the island um, so I, I, I find this this um this notion quite quite interesting because it's it's um nature has very very different ways of of seed disbursement. So you have, I mean, sometimes seeds get um, attached to to fur the animal fur or in the stomachs of animals or or there's like yeah the the, the disbursement mechanisms are quite varied let's say, but but I. I I quite like the understanding of, of the people that come to the exhibit as a disbursement mechanism for, for Nendo Dango. So I, I quite like the idea of people coming to the show and deassembling the installation that I've done and taking those bombs with them and then for them to be able to distribute them in the, in the city of London wherever and whenever they see fit. Um, so I think there, there's there's um, quite nice elements in terms of, of almost like the gamification of the experience. Like you you can take these um, seed grenades basically and and go and disperse them, transgressing borders and barriers and and and, and boundaries uh, as you as you see fit. Um, and obviously. And these 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 uh, will all go to to helping beehives and, and bee colonies because the 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 idea behind these seed bombs will be to have seeds of flowers and plants that typically or or ultimately will be food sources for for beehives and and, and honeybees. One of the reasons why why I do art is is, is this process of unveiling is is pr this process of of discovery. And it's this process of discovering ideas, discovering materials, discovering um, concepts, and it's through a process of making, it's through a process of 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 um, manipulation, of sensation, and a, a process of doing. Um, I mean, for me personally, it gives me great pleasure to 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 work on on my sculptures or my wall-based pieces or whatever it is that I'm working on. It, it just gives me uh, an enormous sense of, um, of satisfaction. I think that the creative process and the production process is very important for me. One of the things that I typically do, I, I tend to put my phone in airplane mode or <laughs> distract or like avoid kind of like um, distractions from, from, from my phone. Um, and typically I work with, with beeswax. I mean, some of the, 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 my favorite things to do is melting and carving beeswax because it, it just, I mean, when I, when I work with a torch and I can feel the warmth of the beeswax melting and I can like, smell the beeswax and I get to carve it as soft as butter um, as I'm working with it. It, it is kind of like a, a, like a fascinating experience altogether. And it, I do appreciate, I mean, uh, the, a flow is, is kind of like a, a, a jaded word, but yeah, I do often appreciate sometimes this, this, this state that you could get when you get really comfortable with the material and you get really comfortable with what you're doing and sometimes that is what I strive towards, is, is understanding how I can get to this, this state in which creativity and, and different elements of 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 of, of, um, of my background come into play and come come into into contact with my work and my creative process.